Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. Uh, it's my pleasure, my great pleasure, to introduce Jennifer Neville to you. Jennifer is an Associate Professor and Miller Family Chair of Computer Science and Statistics here at Purdue University. Professor Neville, and she's come with us, um, even though her department is enjoying an external review right now, so she's giving up quite a lot to be here, and I appreciate that. Her research interests lie in the development and analysis of relational learning algorithms and the application of those algorithms to real world tasks. Today she'll present a talk entitled AI Easy versus AI Hard. If you haven't already done so, I'd ask you to please silence your electronic devices, but don't put them away. So as we learned in the last session, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, if you were heads down on your phone during a presentation that was regarded as a bad thing because you weren't paying attention to the talk, now it's regarded as a bad thing if you're not on your phone because you're obviously not tweeting about it all the time and communicating, Snapchatting or whatnot. But please do silence your devices. We hope to see you tweeting. The hashtag is dawn or doom. And, uh, any equivalent posting to Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, or whatever else, whatever other social means you prefer. Please welcome me, uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jennifer Neville. Okay, thanks, Jerry. Is the mic on? You can hear me okay? Can you hear me now? Yes, good, okay. Okay, thanks uh, for having me here again at the Donner Doom Symposium. This is one of my favorite places to come and talk because I need, I can think at a higher level about talking about what I do uh, to a more general audience than my typical research conferences. So as Jerry said, I have a joint appointment between computer science and statistics. My area of research is machine learning and data mining, and specifically I focus on very complex uh, relational domains where there are, you need to take into account interactions between many entities in order to make efficient predictions, uh, accurate predictions. But today, I'm not really going to talk about my own research. I'm going to really try to give you an, a sense of what's going on in the AI community right now. There's been a lot of uh, interesting breakthroughs uh, over the last few years. There's a lot of excitement about AI. And what I'm going to try to do to, today is uh, compare and contrast two events that happened uh, earlier this year and talk to you about how to think about what's hard and what's easy in this space given those two um, uh, occurrences. So um, really I want to contrast these two recent events that happened earlier uh, in March of this year. So the first major breakthrough that happened was, um, you can see here, uh, March 15th, was the event where Google's AlphaGo system, computer uh, game playing system that plays Go, won over a professional Go player um, here, Lee Sedol. Uh, and it was a major breakthrough for the community. It was something that, uh, at least when I started in the field of AI, was something that I thought about doing. I taught myself how to play Go and realized I couldn't even learn how to play Go, let alone uh, program a computer to be able to, to play it. Uh, and so it, uh, this success happened much earlier than people anticipated. And um, so in the news, this was touted as a major breakthrough and really something that was going to transform what we saw in terms of the successes in AI. However, less than 10 days later, we had another event happen, which you may or may not have heard about in the news. So here, this is uh, March 24th. Um, Microsoft released an AI chatbot onto Twitter. It was called Tay, and it was designed to mimic uh, a young teenage girl that uh, in the AI uh, robot was supposed to interact with millennials and learn how to engage them in conversations on Twitter. And uh, this experiment went horribly wrong, if you didn't see about this uh, in the news. Within 24 hours, this uh, pleasant teenage chatbot turned into a racist, abusive, sexist entity. And Microsoft removed it from the internet uh, within 24 hours of releasing it and apologized uh, profusely about the event. Um, 
And the important thing here is that uh, they didn't anticipate that this was going to happen. Um, some of the news that was uh, explained what was going on blamed us as humans for being horrible people on Twitter uh, and turning this uh, cute little chatbot into a um, horrible mess. Uh, what you might not realize is that Microsoft didn't do this unknowingly, uh, they had a similar type of chatbot called Zhao Ice that was being used for two years previously very successfully in China. And it was interacting with as many as 40 million people. And so what was really the difference between when they rolled it out in China versus when they rolled something out on the general uh, internet uh, for the general public on Twitter? That's what I'll talk about as I get um, more into these systems. But the important thing here that I want to contrast from a technological standpoint is that algorithmically in the machine learning space, there's a lot of shared technology between these two systems. So you might think that a, a computer program that's going to play Go would be very different than an, a robot that, a chatbot that is going to interact conversationally with people. But some of the, many of the methods underlying these are really the same. And so why was one uh, system a major success? and the other a major catastrophe. Uh, to understand this, let's go back to the beginning of AI uh, to learn a little bit about the history. So AI uh, has been around for about 60 years now. Uh, so it was started as a field um, in 1956 when uh, John McCarthy, Marvin Minsky, and Claude Shannon proposed to have a two-month conference, summer conference at Dartmouth to really explore and define what this field should be uh, under the conjecture that all aspects of human intelligence could be encoded in a computer uh, system. Uh, including many aspects of learning. And so when they jump-started the field with this, um, with this conference, there was a lot of excitement, a lot of, uh, a lot of effort uh, in many different directions in the field. I'll focus mostly on machine learning because that is, uh, that is my area, but there are also a lot of other areas um, uh, included in AI that I won't touch on today. So the early work in the field uh, was really inspired a lot by considering how we as humans might be learning and our biological systems. Uh, one of the very first machine learning methods is the perceptron, which was invented uh, by Rosenblatt in 1958. And this was inspired by the neural connectivity in the brain. Uh, this is a mathematical model that's trying to mimic what they thought happened with neurons, where stimulus would come into the neuron and it would um, accumulate up until some point, and once it reached a threshold, it would fire a signal. And so they tried to encode this mathematically in this perceptron here. Uh, another early program was Samuel's Checkers program that he invented in 1959. It started with uh, game planes, the, for one of the first game plane systems, where it would formulate this. Uh, the problem of how to learn and how to play a game as a game tree where you have to look ahead uh, as to what the outcome of the game might be in order to decide a strategy of what moves to play. And the methods that he used to develop this, uh, this system really were the precursors to the um, subfield of machine learning right now that is called reinforcement learning. And that, in that case, there's not an immediate signal that tells you whether you're right or wrong in terms of what decision you've made, but you have to wait wait for some amount of uh, uh, time before you get some feedback as to whether you're headed in the right direction or not. And that is certainly the case with games. And finally, the third thing that I want to point out here is that at the same time, there was another area of AI that was focused on developing dialogue systems. And so these were the precursors to what now are being used in chatbots. And in these systems, there was input from users, and the, the AI system would have to figure out how to make a response to them. And one of the very first examples of uh, this as a successful system was the ELISA system, which was invented by Weizenbaum in 1964. And this was really built um, uh, as a parody, initially, of a Rogerian psychotherapist. And so what would happen, uh, what the system would do is it would interpret uh, some uh, information about what the user had put in through some pattern matching uh, and processing the language that they had uh, inputted, and then uh, picked 
responses based on certain templates that they had in the system. And if you were going to parody a psychotherapist, you can imagine that a lot of the answers were things like, how do you feel about that? Uh, and tell me more, and things like that. And so uh, at first, when Weizenbaum created this system, he really created it to show people how um, difficult the problem of interacting with humans, uh, an AI system with humans, would be. Uh, and he was actually surprised at how many people actually were fooled into believing that this was a, this was a human. And so really, this was the, uh, this jump-started work in that field. So, let's see. OK, so how do these basic systems work? I think this has maybe died. Um, let's uh, consider the, the checkers scenario. Really, the way that we frame these as learning systems uh, reflects how you might think of, if you self-reflected about how you yourself learn how to play a game. This is really what we put into our computer uh, algorithms as well. So if you were going to teach somebody how to play checkers, you would tell them about the board, you would tell them about the pieces and what kind of moves they can make, uh, what are the rules of the game, how do you win the game, and so on. And what you would do is you might start off by watching other people play the game to figure out uh, choices of moves, strategies, and particular scenarios. Or you might play yourself and lose a lot at the beginning, but eventually you would start to understand which moves were good choices and which moves were bad choices so you can improve your strategy over time. So that's exactly what we do when we put that into an algorithm. And the way that you, oh, I'm sorry, I've messed up my order here. So let, before I tell you about the, uh, how the algorithm would do that, let me tell you about the uh, history of the successes that we've had. This is the um, area where a lot of the general public is very excited to see about what is, what is being achieved by these computer uh, programs. And in 1994, the Chinook uh, Checkers program that was developed at the University of Alberta was the first sort of major success at a difficult game where the software was declared a world champion. In 1995, uh, the backgammon playing program, TD Gammon, that was developed in IBM, uh, also got to a grandmaster level. The most surprising thing that happened with TD Gammon is that they found that the moves that the computer program would make uh, were different than what the human players would make. And particularly, they paid opening positions of the backgammon board differently than humans would. And so not only was that surprising, but it eventually uh, was incorporated into human play as well. So the humans learned from the computer program uh, about better strategies than they hadn't thought about before. Uh, some of you may be old enough to remember uh, in 1997, Deep Blue, the uh, program from IBM, also uh, achieved this level with uh, chess where, when they beat Garry Kasparov. Uh, much of the success from the Deep Blue system was really from um, architectural uh, computational improvements that allowed them to do brute force search much faster than uh, we had previously. Uh, so that success was very different than the ability to learn with TD Gammon. But then now, recently, we've seen with AlphaGo those two types of um, uh, successes have been combined together. And so the system, uh, AlphaGo system that uh, was developed by DeepMind and Google uh, has just now beat this nine Dan professional player in Go. And again, had a surprising move that people initially thought was a mistake. Uh, it's called move 37 in game two, if you want to look it up. Um, but, they, uh, but the professional Go player said no human would ever have made that move. But, and at the time when they made the move, it was very surprising when the system made the move, but it turned out to have turned the tide of the game and uh, resulted in a loss for uh, the human player. And so, again, they were surprised by what the program ended up doing. So how do the programs do this? They frame this problem of learning how to play a game in a search tree like this. And so uh, what this search tree, this game tree, uh, shows is all possible board configurations. And so this shows you a part of a search a game tree for tic-tac-toe. And up at the top here, you can see that the board is completely empty. And everybody knows the rules of tic-tac-toe. You have x's and o's. x chooses to move somewhere on the board, these three positions. Um, 
uh, represent all possible positions of where x could go, because this in the middle could be here, here, or here, and you'd have the same outcome, and same for the corner position. Okay? So x has to choose where to go, and then after that, at the next level, then uh, o needs to make a choice based on the available spaces still left on the board. And so you can imagine following through this game tree as you have a sequence of choices by the two players would form a branch in this tree all the way to the bottom of the tree where you'd end up with somebody winning or losing. So this is how we'd frame this as a computational problem. You, uh, in the problem, in terms of deciding how to, which strategies to play, comes from the fact that when you make this move right here, at the beginning of the game, you have no idea, there's no signal as to whether that's a good move or not, until you get to the end of the game and you figure out whether you've won or lost. So what the algorithms need to do is make choices all the way through the game somehow and get signals as to whether they win, lose, or tie, and then propagate those signals back up in order to change their evaluation of particular moves in order to develop a strategy based on their experience. Okay? So the complexity of this uh, algorithmically comes from the size of this game tree and how easy it is to encode it all and get to the bottom and propagate signals back and forth. So the way that we look at the complexity is to look at the size of the game tree. So how big are these game trees? Well, tic-tac-toe, which is a really relatively simple game that you probably don't play anymore unless you have children because you know that you can't win, and uh, has still 100,000 um, leaf nodes on the order of 100,000 leaf nodes in uh, the bottom of the tree. Okay, and so that's still fairly large. Checkers has 10 to the 31. And then you can see with Go here that this is an order of magnitude larger than checkers. So we have 10 to the 360 here. And so just to give you a sense of how big these numbers are, 10 to the 28 is about the number of atoms in your body. And 10 to the 80 is the number of atoms estimated to be in the entire universe. So these numbers are astronomically big, and if you think about exhaustively searching those game trees, there's really no hope. So just to give you a sense of back of the envelope calculation of how long it would take you to search these trees, let's consider the situation where you could evaluate one million board positions every second, okay, which is a lot. If you could do that, maybe our current state of CPUs would be able to do that kind of evaluation, then you would be able to solve, you would be able to search over the entire tic-tac-toe tree in a tenth of a second. But when you move on to checkers, it would still take you 10 to the 18 years to fully search that tree. So it's entirely impractical to think about searching these entire trees. So what we need to do to be able to solve these problems is to resort to machine learning. We need to be able to learn whether a particular move and a particular board configuration is a good move without having seen the entire tree. And the way that we're gonna do that is through learning. So how does the AlphaGo system work? Um, there are papers and many talks on this, and so I'll try to um, characterize it very simply here for you. It's really a combination of the ideas that have evolved from these two historical methods here. So deep learning is really a very complicated version of a perceptron. So it's many perceptrons combined together in many layers. And so then learning is much more complicated than it was with a single node here um, in the middle. But uh, that's where deep learning has grown out of. And so what AlphaGo does is it combines together deep learning and reinforcement learning. Um, so the ideas that come from the checkers playing game where we have to wait and understand what the reward is going to be after we've won or lost the game uh, are also combined into their system. And the way they do this is by learning multiple models and combining them together. So uh, in particular, they have two neural networks that they learn with deep learning. And I think I have an animation here. So here is the, um, the details from their paper. Uh, so one neural network, so you can see there's more complicated networks here. And one neural network is uh, designed to predict the next move given the current state of the board. And that, so that's a very immediate feedback because they're not trying to predict whether they're gonna win or lose. They're just gonna predict the next move. And they train their model on 30 million positions that they uh, acquired from uh, traces of expert games. So human decisions about which moves to make 
make. And then they learned a second model that's going to predict the likelihood that they're going to win a game given the current state of the board. So this is a much longer range prediction of what, how, how good is the situation that they're in at that point. And then, uh, then they update these two models using reinforcement learning and combine the two together in a complicated Monte Carlo search procedure, uh, which, uh, so this is only to tell you that it's not a simple approach. It's a very complicated system to solve this problem, but it's really using many of the simple foundational methods that we've built up in the areas of machine learning and AI. So when you think about these game plane systems, the two dimensions of complexity that decide whether the problem is easy or hard are depend on here the size of the search space as we go from small tractable trees here with tic-tac-toe to things that are intractable like the size of the state space for Go, uh, things get harder. And also the amount of delay you have until you get some feedback that we can use in the algorithm to do learning. That's also another dimension of complexity. Uh, I think I might have forgot to say that one of the factors in these games that uh, impacts the amount of delay you have, it depends on how long the game is. So if your game only requires 10 or 15 moves, then you're going to get feedback after 10 or 15 moves. But if it takes you, on average, 150 moves, then you have to go much further down in the game tree and, and your reward is much uh, more delayed. Okay? So now let's contrast this with dialogue systems and what went on with, get, with uh, Tay. So, in figuring out how to learn how to interact with humans in a dialogue system, uh, really the basic learning procedure is very much the same as what I described for games. But in this case, you need to learn about language and behaviors and interactions with uh, other humans. And so what are the experiences that you're going to have? They're not going to be games with a fixed length of time and a very clear signal of whether you've won or lost in the end, it's you're going to have conversations with people and you're going to have subtle feedback uh, about whether they like you and want to continue engaging with you or not. And so um, this is something that maybe even humans are not all that good at or we're not uniformly good at uh, because uh, you hear about these things like social intelligence or emotional intelligence. People who are able to interpret those signals from other people more effectively are uh, uh, valued as having uh, more emotional intelligence. So from those signals though, once you interpret them, you again should learn um, from the, the feedback, good strategies of how to engage with people and how to extend and uh, uh, make that engagement more effective. So in terms of the history of dialogue systems, we've also had a number of successes along the way um, in uh, the AI community. Uh, so it's the history really started with Eliza, uh, the um, the psychotherapist model that I talked about before. But then in 1995, we had um, the ALICE system, which uh, was able to convincingly mi mimic conversational patterns through natural language processing and heuristic pattern matching. This was inspiration for the Spike Jones movie, Her, that uh, came out in 2013 and was aired at the Dawn or Doom conference uh, back in 2013. And then um, you might think that this next one uh, in, uh, should have gone in the game playing um, list. In 2011, IBM's Watson system won, beat top players at Jeopardy. Uh, but much of the technology that it was using to play Jeopardy are the same types of technologies you need for um, dialogue systems. So they needed to understand the input from the clue and figure out how to answer the question using a lot of natural language processing and information retrieval techniques. And so although there wasn't the same sort of interaction, it was really uh, a big success for the um, natural language processing community. So then something you may have uh, heard about in 2014, there was this system called Eugene Gustman, uh, which nominally passed the Turing test. Uh, it was a system that was developed by three Russians. And in a competition and trying to convince a set of judges that it was human, it was able to convince 33% of the judges that uh, it was human. And so they claim that it passed the Turing test. There's some people that uh, disagree with that claim because this chatbot here, Eugene Guzman, was uh, 
uh, developed as a teenage Ukrainian boy, and they used a lot of uh, particular tricks to uh, hide the limitations of its processing system. Uh, so because it was a young boy uh, who was from another country, it was very forgiving to not quite understand the language or the questions that people are asking it, and also to be more curious, so to be able to ask more questions and deflect uh, the conversation when they didn't know what was going on. And so the, this system, while people think maybe it had, hasn't really passed the Turing test, it did use a lot of techniques like humor and deflection in conversation in a very interesting way that was able to convince these uh, judges that it was human. And so really that should be considered as, as a um, achievement in this area. And so then in 2016, I guess this is, you could disagree whether this is a success, success or not, but when Tay was released by Microsoft, uh, really it, it was successful. In fact, maybe it was a victim of its own success. Uh, so Tay acquired 50,000 followers and tweeted 100,000 times in the first 24 hours that Tay was released. So there was a lot of interest in Tay uh, from many types of uh, groups on the internet, um, but really it was vulnerable to this coordinated troll attack, so hundreds of users uh, identified a way to interact with Tay in order to change the language and structures that the chatbot was using uh, in a way that uh, was not anticipated. Okay, so how do, how do these systems work? I can't describe them in a simple game tree uh, representation for you. So uh, they're much more complicated architectures that have a lot of components, but the main components are that a user has a message either typed in or uh, verbally said, there's some sort of speech recognition and natural language processing that tries to understand the context and the intent and the, um, the task that the user is trying to achieve. And this goes into some sort of dialogue management system, which has all the guts of the um, uh, the, uh, the natural language processing and, and response generation. And there's two basic ways that methods have tried to figure out how to generate responses. The older method is a rule-based matching uh, sort of system that takes some words from the input and tries to match them to certain kinds of templates of the types of response that they should generate, and then goes to a database of responses and figures out how to generate those um, and sends it back to the user. The more uh, current methods are retrieval-based methods that are based on what happens in information retrieval systems that are used at Google and Bing uh, to identify which documents to return for your queries. Uh, they take the same basic technology and take the input as uh, uh, information need and use language models and the contextual to cues to match it to some database of responses and figure out from the relevant responses how to decide what to return to the user. So what's the complexity in how uh, to develop these dialogue systems? The two major dimensions of complexity that contrast with the game playing systems are that although language has structure and rules like games, it's not as clear cut uh, as, the, uh, as the actions and the outcomes in games. Um, so for one uh, reason, it's continually evolving. So words are being added to our language all the time. Rules are broken the way people speak. They don't necessarily follow those rules. They invent slang. There's colloquial terms. There's the use of sarcasm and irony and humor in ways that we use words uh, in which they were not intended. And so this means that the search space for what these algorithms have to consider and how they learn how to behave with this user input is effectively unbounded. So there are an infinite number of possible scenarios that the user can be put in, and you have to develop a, a scenario, a system that's going to be robust and able to adapt to scenarios that they haven't seen before. The second type of issue is that the feedback about whether you're doing something correct is much more vague and unclear. So, and you would know that from your own social interactions uh, and how you try to interpret uh, who's happy with you, who's not, who likes you, who doesn't. Uh, the, the feedback is often unclear and often there's a much longer delay before you 
um, get such feedback. And so you can see this as an issue in terms of what we put as objective functions into our systems. Right now, they would be trying to optimize something like the length of conversations that people have with the chatbots in order to, to use that as a proxy for something like satisfaction or user engagement. So what does Tay do as a system? So again, just like with AlphaGo, it's using deep learning. I guess I should say that uh, the Microsoft people have not written papers that have been published in Nature uh, describing the entire system. So the information that I have here is gleaned from um, many talks that I've seen from people at Microsoft Research uh, about other you know, component technologies that they're developing, as well as some of the information that's been discussed about Tay. It's pretty clear that they're using very complex natural language processing uh, that is based on deep learning techniques as well. And so what they've really done is move beyond these simple matching and retrieval based systems to use complicated deep learning models to predict what kind of responses are likely to be a good match to particular user inputs. And again, they're using massive amounts of training data, just like the AlphaGo system. Uh, so they're using millions of examples of interactions between users that they get from Twitter or other kinds of online sources where you can see uh, these kind of engagements over time. But the big difference here is that um, in this chatbot system, it's really what I would call an open system versus a closed system. There is no clear bounds to the types of interactions that they might have, the types of behaviors they might see from people. And this makes it very vulnerable to attack. So for example, they never anticipated that this kind of coordinated trolling attack would happen uh, when they were developing the system. OK, so the dimensions of complexity here with respect to uh, dialogue systems are similar to the things that we talked about with games. And in this case, now we have a third uh, size of space here, which is an open system or an unbounded search space. And now we have feedback that is not just even just delayed, but it's, it's vague or it's unclear. And so we see um, as we go on in the world, uh, in the development of AI, we, attack, we tackle harder and harder problems with these systems. So, so when we compare the two, the, go, the game playing systems and the chatbots, <coughs> we can see that when the problem can be formulated with clear immediate feedback, in a tractable search space, then we're able to solve it pretty easily. And so those are really the situations where it's uh, considered easy, and we have our major successes um, in the community. But as we go further up to this upper right-hand corner, that's where our problems are still hard and really where the current work needs to happen. So if we go back to uh, discussing the difference between AlphaGo and Tay. So both, uh, when I said that they were built on the same underlying technologies, really that's that they, uh, that they both use deep learning methods that have shown a very significant and impressive improvements in some areas of machine learning lately, as long as they have massive amounts of data from which to train them on. But one major difference between what AlphaGo did and what Tay uh, could do is that Tay can't learn from playing against herself, which is what AlphaGo did. So in the AlphaGo system, because the rules of the game are very clear and whether you win or lose is very clear, they could take different versions of their system and play them against each other to generate even more experience of the different types of uh, uh, sequences of moves and outcomes that you would see. But that's impossible to do with Tay be or it's, uh, you, you could do it, but it wouldn't be successful to make the system robust to the kinds of interactions that you would get in the, in, real world, in the real world with real users because of the variety of kinds of behaviors you would see from users. And so what Tay needs to do to get the kind of feedback and experience that AlphaGo was getting, uh, the Tay needs to be out in the real world interacting with users and using that uh, to figure out how to behave. And so that meant when Tay was released onto Twitter, uh, she was still learning. And so what happened with this coordinated troll attack was that users uh, created conversations with Tay and used language in a particular way that eventually 
made Tay think this is how people talk and this is what I should say. And so eventually, after enough interactions with these kind of people, she was uh, turned into a horrible person. And it, what I like to uh, explain that, to use to, as an example to explain this to students is that if you can think of, although Tay was uh, very successful uh, as an algorithm and had learned a lot of things about interacting with humans, you might think that uh, her amount of knowledge would be equivalent to a seven or eight year old child who had had some experience with interactions with people in a very limited environment. And you don't let a seven or eight year old child out on Twitter, right, to interact with the general public on Twitter. And so the difference when uh, uh, Zhao Ice was uh, operational in China is that in China there's a lot more restrictions on what kinds of information is on the internet because of the uh, cultural control. And so they don't get really the same kind of uh, interactions as you might on Twitter. And so if you think about this, you might say, as I did uh, from an algorithmic perspective, we should have known that this could happen and the algorithm should have been able to detect that people were specifically changing their behavior and how they talked in order to make this chatbot behave differently because of the adversarial setting where they know that they can change the input in a way to change the output um, in, a, in a terrible way. But this is very complicated to detect algorithmically because it's, it's very easy to say in hindsight that there are hundreds of people that uh, participated in this uh, coordinated attack. But when it started, it was very subtle. And it's very hard to detect and know that one individual interaction is not a um, valid one, that it's an adversarial one. And so it's difficult to encode that in a program to figure out how to identify it and adapt. And this is why when we have our young children and we're teaching them how to interact with people, we don't let them go on Twitter right away. We send them to kindergarten and they interact in a very constrained environment with people who are kind and loving to them. And maybe there's some bullies in the class, but eventually they have only just small doses of it until they figure out how to interact in those situations. So in terms of what we need now for future research, really um, what we have to think about is that we have to push in this direction where we're moving to unbounded uh, kind of situations where we're going to have our systems behave. Uh, and this is something that humans are able to do very easily. Well, maybe not very easily. Some people are able to do them very easily. But we expect people to be able to adapt to new situations and learn how to behave with relatively few examples uh, as they have, um, after they have developed over time into an adult. And so um, the, the way that Microsoft is trying to encode this information in their chatbot system is that they're working with improv actors. And so this might be surprising to you that uh, this is something very non-computer science-y, right? Uh, that uh, they found that what do improv actors have to figure out how to do? They have to be, they're thrown into new situations all the time, and they have to figure out how to keep the act going, right? Which is exactly what they want to do with chatbots. And so this is something that they're working with humans who seem to have the skill to figure out how to algorithmatize that uh, ability. And then maybe if we learn more from how they view their interactions, we'll be able to put that into our algorithms uh, easily to deal with this open-ended system. The second issue is with this the d dimension here of feedback. And so we really have to figure out how to deal with this subtle, inconsistent, maybe long-delayed feedback. But that's also something that we do fairly well. Maybe people with emotional intelligence do it better than others, but that's something that we can figure out how to do ourselves. So it should be something that we can figure out how to do in the algorithms. And so the new areas of computational social science or computational humor are the kinds of um, research directions that are trying to take these into account. So computational social science is really nominally the area that I'm in. When I try to come up with machine learning algorithms that will take into account interactions between users, really what I want to move to are complicated situations where 
many people are interacting with many other people, and we'd like to learn how to predict their behavior in those situations, but it's not as fixed an environment as a game playing system where you have continual one on one interactions over time. People interact with different sets of people and then move and uh, change groups and things like that. Um, so the ideas from social science of interpersonal communication, impression management, um, ostracism, all of these kinds of ideas need to be put into our algorithms and our learning methods. Um, computational humor is another area where we're going to have at least a few speakers later on in this conference, including Bob Mankoff this afternoon, talking about how do we how do we understand what's funny? How do we know what's funny? And how do we put that into, uh, how might we put that into an algorithm uh, is another interesting direction to try to deal with the situations where there's not clear feedback. OK, so to wrap this up, we've made really great progress in AI over the last 60 years. Um, we have things now that are starting to become reality where we have self-driving cars that are able to automatically identify what they see um, from sensors and figure out how to adjust the car as it's driving. We have smart buildings that are able to automatically adjust temperatures and air flows based on optimizing um, energy consumption. And we have the beginnings of personalized medicine where instead of deciding one treatment plan for um, large populations, uh, subpopulations of the general public, we're starting to have methods that are being personalized to someone's genome or their history of uh, illnesses over time. And so this is really an exciting time for this field in gen so computer science in general, AI and machine learning specifically. And so you might be tempted to say, oh, well, these dimensions of complexity that I talked about, it's not too hard. We will eventually go into that upper right-hand corner without much effort. But uh, I would caution you here that as a community, we've all, always notoriously underestimated the difficulty of the problems that we're addressing. And so what I'll end with here is this, um, this story uh, that all AI students know about, but you might not know about. So in 1966, so 10 years after the beginning of AI, Seymour Papert, who was one of this group of MIT faculty that really started the field, told his graduate students to solve the computer vision problem as a summer project. And why did he think that they could solve it over the summer? They said, because unlike, he said, because unlike many other problems in AI, many other problems in AI, computer vision was easy because it was clear what we were trying to solve and it was easy to encode that algorithmically. And so now, 50 years later, we're still working on this problem. That was supposed to be a summer project. And so, um, but maybe we're close to solving computer vision fairly soon uh, based on all the work going on in AI. This is, uh, so I'll close here with this image from the Facebook's vision system, which is able to take images that are uploaded on Facebook, and it can automatically identify components of the image and know what they are, so it can produce a uh, textual representation of what's in the image, and that can be used to produce a verbal description for blind people. And so this shows you the capabilities that we have with our systems now in terms of how much can be identified. So from this image here, these are going to be identified as sheep. So all the little blobs are surrounding the objects in the image. And not only can we identify and segment the image and identify the important components, we can also decide what those things are and produce labels for them so that the image can be described to people who can't see it. And obviously, we can use that information to for many other uh, aspects of the Facebook system, but the benefit to um, larger society is clear from this. So I will stop there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jennifer. That was a great presentation. Uh, Jennifer, kindly take some questions from anybody who'd like to, to, to ask. Because we're recording the event, I'd ask you to come up like I did to the microphone. We'll go for about until a quarter of, okay? Thank you.
Hi, Jennifer. Hi. Um, so you mentioned emotional intelligence, mm -hmm. and I have heard some scientists talking, uh, specifically this the, this uh, biologist George Church, who fancies himself a futurist and mm -hmm. is a futurist. Um, he's mentioned before the idea of trying to teach AI emotional intelligence, mm -hmm. and it seems like if we could have taught Tay. Um, to have morality or a sense of emotion that maybe she wouldn't have fallen into the trap that she would have fallen into. And I wonder, is there a way to pre-program morality or is that itself something that we so don't understand that we can't do that? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. I think it, that issue of morality also comes into play when you think about the self-driving cars and the current uh, uh, requirements on how safe the self-driving cars will have to be before they're allowed on the road is a threshold of safety that we as humans can't even meet because somehow we think that uh, the system has to be much, much safer. We can't possibly release a system out in the world that we think will eventually end up killing someone, even though we as systems might go out and get into a car accident and have somebody die, right? Uh, so I think the complexity in that, uh, absolutely, there are people that are thinking about how to algorithmatize that. And I think it's likely that we can, but it, we have to think very diff differently about it than we would with the game playing systems. I think with game playing systems, everybody agrees on which outcomes are good and which outcomes are bad, because you've either won or lost. And uh, when you think of the supervised learning systems that we develop to predict credit card fraud or to detect spam in your email, there is still a fairly clear signal as to whether a transaction is spam or fraudulent. But when it comes to something as complex as morality, we don't even all agree on what the answer is. And so that is something that probabilistically we could encode very easily if we were willing to be satisfied with that kind of encoding. So if you somehow decided on how to value human life and what kind of uh, action you would take if you were about to get into a car wreck with, say, 10 people in front of you, uh, if you're driving, you would get into a car wreck and possibly kill 10 people, or there's one person on the side of the road, but it's your grandmother, what would you decide to do? We would all make different decisions, and if we could answer what decision we would make, we'd probably like to think that, you know, that we don't want to come up with the answer, but we could look at a distribution of what humans would find acceptable, and then probabilistically we could put that into algorithms, but we have to think a lot more carefully about acquiring that feedback and encoding it in order to use it. So, uh, so I think it will come, but I think uh, uh, there's going to be some tough uh, philosophical discussions uh, amongst us as humans as to how do we actually value these things. Because what the algorithms are doing is they're simply valuing different kinds of outcomes. And so once you put a value on things, we can optimize for it. <laughs> so if you as a general public can value human life, then we can start developing systems to, to optimize it. <laughs> so. <laughs> so, uh, various uh, points in your talk, um, the ideas came to me of the possibility of probability of things like computational propaganda and computational surveillance. So I wonder if you'd comment on that. Absolutely, yeah. So that's, um, those are two good uh, issues to bring up. So, so computational propaganda would be the situation where we would inject bots into the world that would try to persuade people to do what we wanted them to, pretending to be, you know, just regular people, uh, just like the way humans would try to propagate that propaganda. Uh, trying to be robust to that or detect that is as difficult as detecting the troll attack because we really have to understand what's valid behavior, what's propaganda, and the line between what's valid and what's propaganda is very... It's very tricky to define because I could be trying to persuade someone to vote for a particular person in the election, 
but I wouldn't necessarily think of that as propaganda, but eventually, if I try, if I go too far in doing that persuasion, you might think of it as propaganda. So uh, I think related to what we just talked about, trying to probabilistically identify these scenarios is going to be much more robust than making a very strict decision, yes or no. And uh, uh, having the system uh, sort of self-monitoring or interacting with humans to say, this is a situation where maybe I think this is going on, uh, let's detect it or, or not. That is something that happens in fraud detection right now when systems are, some of the systems are detecting automatically whether particular credit card transactions are fraudulent and they might immediately shut down your card if it's very clear that it's a fraudulent transaction. But in other cases, they'll notify you as a user to try to get your feedback about that. So what was the second topic? Surveillance, ah, yes. Yeah, that's a very uh, important thing to discuss as well. Um, so you might not realize that these systems are really tracking everything about what you do, everything you say online, every search that you do. Uh, and it's very easy, the security and privacy people have shown that it's very easy to, ident to re-identify you from the trace, your electronic traces of behavior online. So if you had access to my, uh, uh, my search history uh, from my computer, there would be very few people that live in West Lafayette travel to the Bay Area a lot, look at machine learning topics, and are vegan, right? So very quickly, from just a few uh, uh, aspects of my, uh, my profile, you would be able to narrow down that it's probably me from that search history. And so uh, it's a, a sort, of, sort of scary thing. And um, uh, I guess I, my answer to that is, uh, when that data is out there, we can, use, we can choose to use our powers for good or evil. There are always people that are going to be trying to use them for evil, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be developing the, meth the computational methods, because if we understand how things are happening computationally, maybe at least we can identify that this type of thing is going on. And I would say that the privacy-preserving machine learning and data mining community is really focused on trying to have these methods, developing methods where that can be applied for learning in a situation where personal information is aggregated, but yet you can guarantee that there's no leakage of information about any one individual being in that um, setting. And I think those are the types of methods that should give some um, solace to people. That they, so I also say this to my students, you enjoy being targeted, right? Uh, so so you, in your systems, when it gets personalized to your own specific behavior, you, you enjoy the fruits of that analysis all the time, right? So your email is figuring out which people are valid senders and receivers for you so that it can identify what's spam. Uh, the search engines are looking at your history so that once you type a few letters, it already knows what you're searching for. And so this is making your life easier without maybe you even knowing it. So that is the good from it. But uh, as, if people get to the point where they deny you health insurance because you've searched for something particular online and they've identified that you might likely have a pre-existing condition, that would be a very bad scenario. So. That was a really great talk, thank you. And I, to me, you're describing a kind of 50-year process of interaction between data and computation slash algorithms, mm -hmm. where the data sets and the rules move from a relatively finite area to an increasingly more complexity and richness in mm -hmm. terms of the data sets, and the computation comes up because of Moore's law and better algorithms. And that dynamic kind of holds, and then it explodes with search which kind of gives birth to cloud computing, but also an incredible level of unstructured data mm -hmm. that you can start to play with, and social media also does that. So we've had these really big watersheds over the last 10 years. With Tay, you get into this whole other interesting dynamic, which you touched on in terms of the social research, which is not simply the activity of speech, but speech as it is received and speech in its social context, mm -hmm. which is this whole next level of complexity we're gonna have to take on right. for algorithms to handle. It seems like there's almost two fixes to this. One is, the, elemental, the, the elementary one is, recognize that um, you know, it's bad to be a Nazi, 
And so, you know, <laughs> cross that stuff out. The other one is to look at social circumstances. This is coming from the Gamergate guys, mm -hmm. suspect it. Or even more, create countervailing messages to that that will correct Tay. Because part of the Tay problem was right. once she started to get a little Nazi, all the nice people stopped talking to her. That's so a good it point, became yes. a, a self reinforcing right. loop. Right. So one counter would be more nice people come here and talk to this poor lady. I guess the question is, as we move into this kind of AI, aren't we also reprogramming ourselves? Yeah, that's a very good observation. Uh, I think that uh, the, the observation you made about that we should have more nice people talk to Tay, I think affects not only the algorithms, but humans as well. So you hear about people leaving Twitter after they have horrible interactions with people. And so we can't even fix that problem for humans, but maybe, just maybe, if we understood how to fix it for the algorithms, we would be able to improve things for ourselves as well. And so that's uh, some of the, um, the social research, uh, social science research that I was alluding to, you know, focuses on things like encouragement, positivity, um, creativity, and how to foster those kinds of feelings and behaviors in people. And if we understood better how that worked in humans, we might be then able to put it into algorithms. But at the same time, if we come up with solutions algorithmically that would fix Tay's divergence into this horrible state, that might also inform the social science to think about the structures that they've been looking at more computationally. And so, you know, something like 10 positive interactions a day might make everybody feel happier. I don't, I don't know. But I think it's an important uh, thing to, to think about. And I guess my, my point of interacting more with people in social science and philosophy and humanities um, is that as engineers, we tend to not think about these things. We like to put it into a mathematical equation. I guess I did not put any math in this talk, but usually every talk I have has equations, right? I just want to uh, distill everything in a very precise mathematical equation, but all of these issues are maybe hard to uh, quantify in, in a mathematical equation. And um, so it's really from discussion with these uh, people with more social and emotional intelligence than we as engineers have uh, that, that would be able to help us put that uh, into uh, our algorithms and our systems. I think we will have, uh, if we have the right kind of back and forth between those two communities, I think we will make great progress in the systems while at the same time learning a lot about ourselves. Hello, oh, Professor. Um, <clears throat> sorry, um, I was wondering, um, about your opinion on Tay, what if she was trained um, I, isolately, like um, isolating it to just kindergarten uh, conversations, like where kind people talk to it, and then it learns from them, and then you can track progress, like first train it with uh, people that you usually talk to when you're, in, you're a kid, and then you grow up, teenager, and finally mm -hmm. adults. Um, what would have happened if we tried to train um, Tay as a perfect human rather than just letting it out open in the Twitter stream? Well, so I guess I'm, I'm not sure quite how to answer that. Uh, absolutely, one of the issues with Tay is that Tay was doing continuous learning. And so there are, there are two things that we could have done. We could have had more training to reinforce Tay's behavior in kind, trustworthy environments before rolling it out uh, to the general public, um, and then stop our learning, right? So we could say, we've learned only in these very fixed environments, and then we're gonna stop, so we'll be robust to these, um, these attacks moving forward. But in that, that kind of system would be brittle because it would not be able to adapt to new situations that it hasn't seen before. So we really need to, ha to be able to adaptively learn from the new situations that we see, but one of the issues that could be adjusted uh, and probably is being adjusted in new developments of these systems is that the, uh, the algorithm learn based on the data that they have. And so we could, you could imagine a scenario where we weight 
the training data coming to us based on trustworthiness. So that uh, for particular kinds of interactions, if they involve words like Nazi, genocide, you know, maybe we say that's fairly untrustworthy, so we should weight those very low, and we won't update the aspects of the model very much when we see those kind of interactions. But if there's particular people that we trust, like our parents or our siblings or our relatives, and we see new interactions with them, we would upweight those and say, now adjust to these new kinds of interactions because those are probably valid interactions. And so work on figuring out, there is work in the area of, um, with reviews and online systems and trying to automatically identify how trustworthy something is. And so we could potentially use those kind of things to make the system adapt and learn more robustly by basically understanding what kind of data is coming in. So, yeah. Good morning, Professor. Uh, I had a question that the difference between artificial intelligence and machine, intelligent machines is very great. You, you never know exactly where the line is drawn. So for example, people here like, are, like you, you have been discussing about Tay, the old talk, and we have come up with ideas like constraining her to specific talks, to specific people, or specific situations. But the thing is, if we do that, can it really be called the artificial intelligence? Because if we are constraining it, then it's just another intelligent machine, and not exactly a thing that can learn for itself. Yeah, sure. The, uh, the definition of what is intelligence, what is learning, is very, is very fuzzy. So these early systems like Eliza was not doing anything that you would think of today as being intelligent, but at the time they talked about it as an AI system. There are things that we do in machine learning that I even had this discussion with my grad students last week, that if we simply write out an equation and optimize it, but we handcrafted that equation to reflect a particular scenario. Are we learning? I don't know. We have a system that does something based on optimizing that equation, but maybe it hasn't learned anything about the environment. Uh, and so in everything that we develop as computer scientists, we tend to go back and forth between the two. Um, so really when we focus more on the engineering um, and making a system that works, we often put in things that are hand-coded or manually uh, specified in order to just get the kind of outcome that we're looking for, and then we sort of tweak it to, uh, to behave well in the scenarios that we want it to. And then as we try to abstract that theoretically, we really try to move to a more general concept. And so I would say that those two kinds of things are always there mutually hand in hand in these scenarios. And uh, when we're making better progress of un understanding at a higher level, we're pushing to these more theoretical uh, abstractions, but we also make a huge amount of progress by just making specific decisions. So I would think that they're both useful systems, uh, but this may be a philosophical issue uh, to decide whether they, you think of them as actually intelligent or not. So we, okay. So uh, Professor Neville always gives a fabulous presentation. I think I've l discovered my next career, which will be providing consolation uh, to social media users. So I'd like to get an early start on that by telling you that you're all uh, better looking and smarter because you attended this talk. <laughs> With no fear of contradiction, I'd like you to give a very warm thank you to Jennifer.